Um, so, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the uh, webinar. Um, today's talk is going to be um, mostly focused on um, the paper where Ning is the first author. Um, and um, the paper was published in Cell Systems in 2018. Um, and it focuses on prologous transcription factors and how um, they end up binding different targets uh, in the cell. So I don't have to convince this audience that the genomic binding of transcription factors is very complex. Uh, many times we think of transcription factors as just simple proteins binding in a promoter or enhancer and regulating a particular gene. Uh, but actually in the cell, the picture looks more like this. Um, it's very complex. The genome is decorated with um, a lot of uh, various proteins, including nucleosomes and transcription factors. Um, some transcription factors bind DNA directly by themselves to regulate their targets. Um, others bind indirectly through mediating proteins. Some transcription factors bind cooperatively to DNA. Um, others bind to DNA by themselves, but together they cooperate to regulate their target genes. And something that is not studied a lot is actually the competitive binding of transcription factors. Um, and this is especially true for parologous transcription factors or factors from the same protein family. And this is what we're going to focus on today. So overall, in my lab, we're developing quantitative approaches to study the genomic recruitment of human transcription factors and to understand how this recruitment is affected by mutations and more recently by DNA damages. As a very general approach, um, in my lab, we're trying to reduce this complexity um, that is present in the cell uh, in order to study individual aspects of transcription factor recruitment to the genome. So we develop new assays um, to measure binding of transcription factors to genomic DNA, but in a cell-free system that is in vitro. Um, and a lot of our technology is based on the protein binding microarrays that were developed in my um, postdoctoral lab by Martha Bullock. Um, and there are various aspects of transcription factor binding that we study using uh, these in vitro technologies. Uh, we do look at individual binding of transcription factors to DNA, um, but also cooperative binding, competitive binding, and also we study the effect of mutations and lesions on transcription factor binding. And we prefer these in vitro systems because they offer us the opportunity to make quantitative measurements of binding of a particular protein or group of proteins to usually tens of thousands of DNA sites simultaneously. Um, and the data tends to be very reproducible as qu and quantitative as I'll show in a bit. Um, but today we'll focus on uh, parologous transcription factors. So we know that in human, most transcription factors are part of large protein families. And here I'm showing just four of the families in human cells. Um, transcription factors from the same family, so parologous TFs, uh, usually have indistinguishable motifs or position weight matrices, as shown here for a few pairs of uh, paralogs. So these some small differences between the PWMs shown here could easily come from variation in the experimental conditions. And they're not differences that could explain anything that happens in vivo in terms of differences between paralogs. So all of these uh, paralogs have very, very similar motifs. When we look at their targets in the cell, for example, uh, by ChIP-seq, we see that although there is a significant amount of overlap between their targets, um, there are also targets that each paralog binds uniquely. Um, and here I'm showing an example for MIC and MAD. Um, we can also see the same thing for um, E2F's proteins, ADS proteins, and so on. Um, and even if we try to learn motifs from their ChIP-seq data, and these are the motifs shown on this slide, uh, the motifs really look indistinguishable. Um, so then for several years now, I've been wondering how do these paralogs achieve differential specificity in the cell? One obvious question could be uh, through chromatin or epigenetics. And there are actually studies claiming that um, different histone marks attracts different transcription factors. Um, but it's not clear what is cause and what is effect. Um, do really the chromatin marks attract different transcription factors or does the binding of certain transcription factors cause a certain chromatin environment? 
And we believe the second is actually more likely. And there's a very nice example in this science paper from 2016, where a single binding event of a MIB uh, transcription factor um, drives a whole super enhancer. So such binding events can really organize the chromatin. Now, of course, when we look at certain proteins like MIC and MAD shown here, MIC is an activator and MAD is a repressor. Uh, so of course the chromatin environment at their, at their binding sites is gonna be very different, uh, but we don't know yet what causes what. Um, it's a similar case for cofactors. Um, we do know that cofactors are predictive of differential binding of paralogs, and we, uh, we've shown this in an NAR paper back in 2014. Um, but what is cause and what is effect is not clear. Um, it can definitely be that cofactor, different cofactors interact with different paralogs, and that makes the paralogs bind different genomic regions. Um, but it could be that also that the paralogs bind the, um, first and then recruit the cofactors, or the binding events are um, independent. So we are still looking at the effect of cofactors um, in my lab, but before we did that, um, we wanted to ask a simple question, um, and that's whether the intrinsic specificity of the transcription factors can contribute to this differential in vivo binding. Um, and this is the project at uh, Ninglad in my lab before uh, graduating and was published in Cell Systems in 2018. So briefly, what we did in this study um, is first we wanted to compare the binding specificity of parologous TFs for their putative genomic targets, um, but not in the cell because we have that data that is chip seek, um, but we wanted to make these measurements in vitro. So briefly, we wanted to take the chip seek peaks um, and measure in vitro binding of purified TF1 and TF2 um, to all these in vivo targets. Um, and we wanted to do direct measurements here in order to alleviate any concerns related to modeling. Because one could say that, yes, um, the PWMs of TF1 and TF2 are identical, uh, but maybe those models are not entirely correct and that's why we don't see any differences. So to avoid any issues related to how accurate the models or the predictions are, we wanted to just do direct measurements, but in vitro, where we have only the purified proteins and the naked uh, genomic DNA. And importantly here, we focused on genomic DNA because our rationale was that if there are any signals in the DNA that distinguish the target sites of two paralogous TFs, then those signals should be in the genome. Um, if we try to generate some artificial sequences, uh, we wouldn't really know what sites to choose. Uh, but definitely these proteins bind differently in the genome, so we might as well use the genomic sequences. So this is what we did uh, from each uh, ChIP-seq peak. Uh, we identify putative sites for TF1 and TF2, our paralogs of interest, um, and we can do this as a very low cutoff. Alternatively, we can also tile entire peaks if we choose to. Uh, we took these putative sites in their genomic context uh, to get sequences of about uh, 30 to 40 base pairs. And we wanted to um, measure in vitro binding of the two paralogs to these sequences. Now, there are several assays one can use to do these measurements. Um, we chose to do this using genomic context protein binding microarrays or GCPBMs. Um, this is a technology um, that's based on the protein binding microarrays, but it uses libraries that contain genomic sequences. Um, so briefly, we take sequences from the genome. Um, we send them to Agilent, a company that synthesizes single-stranded DNA uh, attached to these glass slides. Um, and we, in the lab, we double-strand the DNA and then incubate it with a transcription factor of interest and then with a fluorophore conjugated antibody. Um, and we simply measure the amount of uh, bound transcription factor um, using a microarray scanner. Now we've used this technology in several um, of our projects. Uh, many times when we talk about this uh, and we mention the word microarray, people think this is obsolete. Uh, why aren't we using sequencing instead? Um, so I'll just replace the word, the word microarray with on chip. Um, so indeed microarrays are um, obsolete for things like gene expression um, and measuring in vivo binding of transcription factors to DNA. 
um, but they are still used in a lot of biomedical applications. And in our case, uh, microarrays are simply um, pieces of uh, glass um, that have DNA molecules attached to them. Um, and we do these experiments, the, the protein binding experiments on chip, um, because they allow us to do a lot of high quality measurements simultaneously. So just a few advantages mentioned here of doing the experiments on a chip. Um, the experiment itself, the PBMs are very simple. Um, every spring semester, we actually have high school students in our lab doing such experiments and generating beautiful data. Um, so it's nothing complicated. Um, because they don't require sequencing, uh, we don't have to worry about sequencing bias and PCR amplification. Uh, we don't have to worry about cross-linking. Um, like from formaldehyde uh, that is used in ChIP-seq. Uh, we don't have any pull down steps. So although we use antibodies, they don't need to be super high quality. Um, and basically the, exper the data comes from imaging. So it's a very simple experiment, very few steps, which also means very few biases and sources of noise. We do look at alternative approaches in our work. We actually use uh, um, MSAs and fluorescence and isotropy in our lab, but of course those are low throughput. We cannot use them for tens of thousands of sequences. Um, we do sometimes resort to sequencing based methods like SPEC-seq, HD-SELEC, SELEC-seq and so on. Um, the caveat there is that if we want to obtain quantitative data over a wide range of affinities, um, that requires very high depth and at some point these kinds of experiments become uh, prohibitive. Um, we are also uh, collaborating with labs that do microfluidics. Um, those are difficult to implement by a new lab, but they can also offer a medium throughput and very accurate measurements. And of course, all of these techniques are fine if we just wanna generate motifs or PWMs. Um, but in our work, we're interested in quantitative binding measurements, and that's why we choose this uh, PBM platform. Um, in terms of reproducibility, um, our genomic context PBM data is highly, highly reproducible. Um, this is a plot from our cell systems paper where we compared um, two in vitro binding experiments for human transcription factor MAD. Um, in here, each point represents a 36 base pair um, genomic region centered on a MAD binding site. And the gray points here are negative controls that should be bound on specifically by the protein. Uh, the rest are genomic sequences that we believed um, have, should have some specific binding signal. And the axes um, uh, are just normalized in vitro binding levels, uh, normalized to be between zero and one. Um, so you can see the reproducibility is really good. Um, this is probably the best replicate plot that we have, um, but in general, uh, for these experiments, the reproducibility is somewhere between uh, 0.95 and 0.99. In addition to being highly reproducible, one thing we like about this um, assay and in general about uh, chip-based assays um, is that they agree very well with affinity data. Um, so in this plot, uh, which you can also find in our, I think it's in our supplementary material, we compare the fluorescence intensity uh, on the, from the GCPBM experiment. And this reflects the level of bound protein um, at each spot. Uh, we compare these to Mitomi um, derived uh, equilibrium dissociation constants. And Mitomi is a microfluidic um, assay. And here we can see great agreement between um, the independently measured KDs and our fluorescence intensity measurements from the array. Um, since this paper, um, we've actually done a lot more comparisons to uh, independently measured KD data. Um, and I'm showing here six examples um, where we compared the log of our fluorescence intensity um, to several uh, KD data sets from fluorescence anisotropy, surface plasmon resonance, Mitomi, EMSAs, and we can see an excellent agreement between the two um, experiments. So we're really confident that our measurements on these chips um, recapitulate the actual binding levels of the transcription factors. And importantly, they do this over a wide range of KDs, somewhere between one micromolar and one nanomolar affinities. So with this, I'll 
switch over to Ning uh, to tell you about uh, some of our results. Yes. Um, so thank you, uh, Raluca, for the introduction uh, part. So uh, for with the GCPBM experiment design, we carried out um, this experiment to test paralogous factor binding uh, for a few different transcription factor families. Um, the first example I'm showing here is a direct comparison of the measurement between uh, MIG versus MAD pro uh, protein. These two factors uh, both belong to the BHLH family. As you can see, their motifs are highly uh, similar. And um, it's kind of expected that their um, GCPBM measurements are also highly correlated with an R squared of 0.88. Um, However, when we compare this to the, uh, nap, uh, to the uh, replicate experiment with an R square of 0.99, we still clearly see some difference between the paralogous factors. The next example is uh, the ETS family factors, ETS1 versus ALK comparison. Um, again, a very similar motif between the two factors but uh, clearly the two factors um, have a lot more uh, variation in binding preference uh, compared to the replicate experiment. If we go to the E2F uh, factor comparison, E2F1 versus E2F4, uh, we are observing the same uh, effect. While the two uh, closely related factors have a uh, very good correlation in uh, binding specificity, they are clearly um, different compared to a replicate experiment. So uh, taking these three examples together, um, I hope it's um, easy to convince you that um, just by visual inspection, uh, there's some difference between these um, closely related factors but why is their uh, PWM motifs uh, almost indistinguishable? Because when we look at the highest binding site, focusing on the top right corner of each plot, um, we realize all these factors uh, have the, hi the uh, highest affinity for the same sequence set, which is very well represented by the PWM motif. So if all, if all you care about is the most uh, strongly uh, bind sites, the PWM motifs um, are doing a very good job. However, the uh, DNA sequences that are preferred differentially by these paralogous factors are mostly in the medium to low affinity sites. So the next question we ask is, um, we show this uh, difference across multiple families. Are these, um, are these effects general for all factors? Actually, no. In another example um, we tested uh, in the RUNCS family, a comparison between RUNCS1 and RUNCS2 factors actually showed almost identical uh, correlation to the replicate experiment as shown in the figure here. So um, it's not a, a common to all the factors really depending on the specific factor and family. But how, uh, so right now I showed a visual inspection, but how can we quantitatively define whether two proteins uh, have identical specificities or not? And if the proteins are different, how do we identify the DNA sites that are preferred differently by the two proteins? To answer this, uh, we developed a method uh, called, uh, we developed a preference score method using a weighted uh, regression. Uh, here we uh, use the replicate experiment to learn about the uh, variance in the model and uh, we fit 
a regression model in the comparison between the paralogous factors um, to uh, to learn about the correlation between the two model uh, between the two factors. So on the right panel, you can see that uh, we derived a 99% confidence interval, which is the uh, size colored in gray as prediction uh, as prediction band for the replicate uh, trans uh, for the replicate transcription factors. So any sequence that lies within these um, gray area are considered uh, variation within experimental variation, e experimental noise. So these are the sequences preferred equally by the two factors. And then the different um, level of preference by the different factors are colored um, differently with a z-score measurement. So um, after building this model, we were able to uh, better quantify the differential preference between the uh, different paralogous factors. Here is a summary of the four different uh, protein families I just mentioned with a few more uh, uh, family member factor comparison included. As we can see, uh, for most of the factor uh, comparisons, usually we observed 15% to 60% uh, of the measured sequences are actually preferred differently by the two closely related factors. Whereas for the uh, comparison of ranks one and ranks two, only less than 10% of the uh, sequences are considered differentially preferred. So, Looking back at these um, ways, we, ob we observed the differentially preferred sequences, but what are the um, sequence and structural features that uh, is driving the difference in the specificity between them? We uh, observed that these differences uh, can contribute, can come from different uh, preference in just the core binding site. Um, here on the top panel, we are showing the comparison between MIC and MAD binding and um, just colored by different core motifs. Um, and on the uh, lower panel, we are showing the comparison between ETS1 and ELK1 binding, um, show, again showing different um, sequences with different core binding motifs. So we can see that even for the core binding motifs, um, these can, there can be some difference in binding preference. For sequences with the same core uh, motif, the flanking sequence can also contribute to differential preference. Again, I'm showing the comparison between MAKEMAD and ETS1 versus ELK1. As you can see here, uh, for the same core sequence, when the flanking sequence are different, um, there are clearly some difference in the binding specificity between them. For these sequence features, we actually uh, derived a positional KMER uh, support vector regression model that uh, uses the different sequence features uh, to uh, build a quantitative model that predicts binding specificity for each of the transcription factors that helps us to learn about um, the contribution of each of the sequence features to the binding of the factor. So that was about the sequence. What about uh, the structural preference? when we check the uh, sequences that are preferred differently by these uh, transcription factors, we find that uh, the flanking region, uh, the uh, DNA shape structural feature of the flanking uh, region are different by the differentially preferred sequences. Here I'm showing on the top panel the uh, predicted minor group width and we can, uh, the blue, colors are for the MIC preferred sites and the uh, red colors are for the MAD preferred sites. On the lower panel, we are showing the predict 
predicted rho angle between adjacent nucleotides. And we can see that for both these two um, structural, DNA structural uh, DNA shape features, they are also preferred differently. So what is the pos possible application of this when we um, actually, uh, we are showing that uh, here in this example, we can look at the effect of non-coding mutations on transcription factor binding with much greater specificity. So uh, I'm showing here an example of a, a clean var recorded non-coding mutation um, in the pork gene regulatory region. This mutation is associated with malignant prostate cancer. And we can see that um, the mutant sequence created a ETS binding um, site with the PWM motif. This can help us uh, make a prediction that we, uh, the, mu the mutation sequence created an ETS binding site. So any member in the ETS family are likely to uh, bind here. Whereas with our um, P.M., uh, with our GCPBM uh, and SVR model, we actually uh, predicted this site to be a strong ELK binding site um, and not specific ETS1 binding site. So we would be able to make a much more specific prediction on which um, individual uh, ETS family member bind on this site. That is one single example. We uh, generalize this into um, the catalog of non-coding mutations uh, in cancer and trying to learn about the patterns. So here uh, I'm showing an example uh, of the non-coding somatic mutations in a melanoma cancer uh, data set uh, we obtained from ICGC. And we can see that uh, in the comparison, we are comparing the uh, mutation change between ELK1 binding versus the change between the ELK2 ETS preference score. On the um, highlighted circle here, uh, which uh, when we look at the mutations that have the strongest change in, effect, in uh, change effect in ELK1 binding specificity, which is typically uh, how people you know, look at mutations, um, we can see that the sites that, uh, the mutations that change ELK1 binding strongest have little change in the preference uh, of the ELK2 ETS. Um, so the y-axis uh, score are very low. So this agrees with our previous comparison that the strongest binding sites are preferred equally by different family members. Um, however, when we look at um, the sites that change the binding preference between these um, family members, um, these are factors that doesn't lead to a strong change in elk binding. So, if we only focus on prediction of individual factor binding change, we could miss this whole group. And another subset we observed very interestingly is uh, highlighted on the left panel. This is the mutations that has almost no change in ELK1 binding, but they have pretty good change in the ELK1 versus ETS1 preference uh, binding change. So these uh, we would also miss if we only focus on a prediction of ELK. So um, next I'll go uh, hand back to Raluca. Okay, thank you, uh, Ning. So, uh, uh, one thing I wanna uh, mention also is that these 
um, all the GCPBM data we generated and the models and genome-wide predictions are available through our IMAP web server. Um, we have here all the models um, mentioned in the paper and we're hoping to add several more models um, very soon. Um, so IMADS um, stands for Integrative uh, Modeli Modeling and Analysis of Differential Specificity. Uh, and our web server allows users uh, to choose a particular model. This can be a model for one TF um, or for um, differential specificity between two paralogs, like shown here for E2F1 versus E2F4. Um, users can also choose a set of genes or a set of genomic coordinates of interest, um, a specific region around the transcription start site, um, if the user is interested in a list of genes. Um, and then the predictions are shown. Um, in this example, the gray sites are the sites that are bound similarly by E2F1 and E2F4. Um, and then we colored either red or blue, the sites that are um, <clears throat> preferred by either of the two paralogs. Um, so we offer predictions of specificity, but also differential specificity, and these can be downloaded and analyzed further. Um, but related to what Ning was saying about making predictions um, about the effects of uh, single nucleotide variants, we also have um, a service um, to make predictions on new sequences. Um, so if you have sequences of interest uh, where mutations happen in the human genome, those can also be used with our server um, to predict the change in individual specificity or differential specificity between two proteins. And one thing I should also mention is that we are very confident in our predictions. Um, Ning mentioned that we use support vector regression. Um, to predict the binding of individual transcription factors. And this is a plot showing the accuracy of the SVR models uh, compared to replicate experiments. So the gray bars here represent replicate GCPBM experiments. Uh, and as I mentioned before, their accuracy is very high with our squared um, getting close to one. Um, the SVR models trained on this data um, get really close to the replicate experiments. So although we don't have a direct measurements for all genomic sequences that could be bound by these proteins, um, we are confident in using the SPR models to predict on any genomic sequence or any mutated sequence um, of interest. And in the end, these SVR models are actually not that complicated. Um, many times linear kernels work very well. Um, but one thing that was important in modeling the specificity of proteins based on this data was to use dinucleotides and trinucleotides in addition to the uh, mononucleotides that would also be used by a position weight matrix. Um, what we believe makes these models very accurate is maybe not so much the uh, support vector regression or the use of uh, di and trinucleotides, but also the fact that the training data is highly quantitative um, and accurate. So that was important also for the modeling. Now, knowing that our models do so well in vitro, uh, we next asked whether the intrinsic specificity differences that we do see in vitro contribute to differential in vivo binding. And we had to ask this question because it could be that our in vitro assays are just very sensitive. And we can see even the tiniest difference between two paralogs, but actually in vivo, that kind of difference doesn't make any um, uh, contribution. So to ask about the in vivo relevance, uh, we use ChIP-seq data, uh, which is the most widely available uh, data for um, in vivo binding. We do acknowledge that ChIP-seq data is a, at best semi-quantitative. Uh, we are trying very hard to squeeze any quantitative uh, measurements from ChIP-seq. Um, we don't really consider it in vivo binding. Uh, because technical biases and noise are introduced at every step in this experiment. So although ChIP-seq is probing in vivo binding, we recognize that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of other signals on top of it. So biases can be introduced during uh, shearing of the DNA and cross-linking, um, <clears throat> also due to the antibody um, sequencing and PCR amplification, and even the computational processing of the data to generate a nice uh, chip seek peaks were used to, those computational steps can also introduce particular um, 
biases. But keeping all this in mind, we still wanted to use the um, ChIP-seq data in our analysis and see if uh, the in vitro specificity differences we capture in vivo are ref in vitro are reflected in vivo. So uh, this work was done by um, Yuning, a current uh, PhD student in my lab. Um, and we started with a ChIP-seq data for two paralogs of interest, TF1 and TF2. Um, and as an example here, I'm showing uh, ChIP-seq data for MAD and MIC. Um, taking the two transcription factors of interest, uh, we took the union of all their ChIP-seq peaks and sorted these uh, in decreasing order of the log ratio of MAD to MIC ChIP-seq signal. So if we look at the top of this list here, uh, these would be the MAD preferred uh, peaks because they have a much uh, larger signal for MADs than MIC in the ChIP-seq data. The bottom of the list are the MIC preferred peaks, which have a much larger signal for MIC versus MAD. Um, overall, um, there is a significant amount of overlap between the peaks of these two transcription factors, and you can kind of see this a lot in the middle. Um, but there are also peaks that are called for each protein individually. Now here we didn't want to look at this kind of Venn diagram of ChIP-seq peaks, uh, but more quantitatively at the ChIP-seq data. And we asked whether we can distinguish MAD preferred peaks versus MIC preferred peaks just based on our in vitro models of differential specificity. And these are our IMAT models. So since I'm asking this question, obviously the answer is yes. We are able to tell these two apart. And here are two examples. And for this, we used the receiver operating characteristic curves and we computed the area under the curve. Um, again, we're looking at the comparison of TF1 preferred peaks versus TF2 preferred peaks. And we're comparing the top versus bottom, um, in this case, 10% of peaks in this sorted list of uh, TF1 versus TF2. So our positive and negative set here are balanced. So it's okay to use an ROC curve and I'm showing here two examples of MAD versus MIC and E2F1 versus E2F4. Um, and you can see here in purple, um, the ROC curve for our IMAD models. And in both cases, they do um, really well, especially in the case of E2F1 versus E2F4, we were happy to see that even at a low false positive rate, uh, we get a high true positive rate for distinguishing the in vivo targets of the paralogs based simply on in vitro data. Um, we compared our IMADS results with in vitro PWMs. So these were PWM models trained on our GCPBM data. Uh, so they use the same data as the uh, purple lines here, uh, but not looking at differential specificity, looking at the specificity of each protein. And we can still capture a little bit of the signal. Um, but, um, and this is true for uh, E2F1 and E2F4, not so much for MIC versus MAD, where our in vitro PWMs are really um, close to, given an um, area under the curve close to 0.5. We also compared um, against PWMs trained on ChIP-seq data. And this is exactly the ChIP-seq data used for testing. So these PWMs trained on ChIP-seq here could actually be um, overfitting the data. But um, even with that in mind, we do see that these ChIP-seq trained PWMs don't do nearly as well as our IMAT models of differential specificity. Um, so we were happy to see that these in vitro differences that we're capturing um, are not just because of the sensitivity of our in vitro assays, but they are truly reflected in the in vivo data. Um, I'm not showing it in the slides, but we also try to somehow get the same kind of signal from the chip data itself, because obviously um, the signal is in the chip data, but that's very hard because of all the other um, effects that contribute to the final um, chip seek peaks. I should also, also mention here that we were happy to see that if we use poor quality chip seek data, we don't do well with our IMAT models. Um, with poor quality data, which is usually ChIP-seq data where the replicates don't actually agree very well. Um, 
on some of those poor quality ChIP-seq data sets, um, PWMs trained on a ChIP-seq data sometimes did very well. Our in vitro models never did well on poor ChIP-seq data, which was um, reassuring. I also, I would argue that um, this contribution of in vitro specificity to in vivo binding here is actually an underestimate um, because in, in these analyses uh, that we present in the paper, we were simply looking at the individual binding of TF1 and TF2 to their genomic sites. Now, when we look in a cell, TF1 and TF2 could be present at different protein concentrations. Um, so in the end, uh, how much each transcription factors uh, transcription factor binds a particular site uh, will depend on the competition between the paralogs. And the fact that the paralogs have differential specificity means that this competition will be different at different sites. Um, and that is something that we're trying to um, study in a lot more detail now. Um, and we hope to have a paper submitted soon um, where we model um, also using our uh, on-chip platform the competition between parologous transcription factors and show that that can really help us explain in vivo binding and even uh, gene expression regulation. So, so the take home messages that um, I would like to, to leave you with if you don't remember anything else from our paper or this talk um, are the following two messages. Um, one is the, that the binding of transcription factors in the cell uh, depends on the competition with the co-expressed transcription factor paralogs. So oftentimes we look at uh, ChIP-seq data um, for a transcription factor, I'll just call it TF1 here, and we think that this is reflecting the in vivo binding levels of TF1. Um, sometimes we also consider that uh, cofactors could influence this binding and maybe lead to um, taller or smaller peaks, depending on the effect of the cofactors. Um, but the way we think about the data now is that this is ChIP-seq data for TF1, but in competition um, with the co-expressed paralogs. And it could be TF2, TF3, TF4, and so on. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, most human transcription factors are part of, part of large families. And although not all family members are expressed in every cell, there are usually at least two paralogs expressed. So now when we look at ChIP-seq data, we try to keep in mind the fact that paralogs that are also present in the cell could actually affect um, this binding data. And this also means that uh, when we learn a DNA binding model from ChIP-seq data, that model will reflect intrinsically the effect of these paralogs and the competition with the paralogs. And um, we try to, to show this uh, in the paper I mentioned that we're um, hoping to submit soon, where we see that depending on how much competitor we add in an experiment, um, the motif for our transcription factor of interest changes. Um, so it's important to think about um, these ChIP-seq data sets as including the effect of competition with paralogs and of course, also the effects of chromatin accessibility and uh, cofactors and so on. The other uh, take home message is that um, when mutations occur in transcription factor binding sites, they may have different effects on different family members. Um, and this was a very nice example that Ning presented and that we also have in the uh, paper where an A2G mutation created a binding site for the whole ETS family. That's how one would predict based on position weight matrix models. Um, but if we look more carefully at the quantitative uh, binding specificity of the family members, we see that um, this mutation creates an, ads, uh, an elk site, but not an ad site. So again, it's important to look at these proteins, not one protein at a time, because a mutation could have no effect on let's say ETS1 binding, but still affect it by affecting the specificity of the paralogs. And indirectly through competition, it could still affect our transcription factor of interest. So um, in my lab, we also um, analyze cancer mutations in non-coding regions. And we try to keep in mind this, uh, this important fact that paralogs and their contributions 
uh, th their competition may contribute to the effects we see in the cell. Um, so just to um, summarize, um, what we found is that prologous transcription factors can differ in specificity and that can be true even if their PWMs are indistinguishable, like in many of the examples we show in this paper. Um, it's not that they are always different, and Ning showed a nice example of ranks one and ranks two. Um, we do see identical specificity, especially when the proteins are not expressed at the same time. Um, but for transcription factors that are co-expressed, we typically do see differences. Um, we identify these differences by analyzing quantitative in vitro binding data, but to genomic DNA. Um, so where we synthesize genomic DNA on these glass slides, uh, measure binding very quantitatively, and then we could look at the sites preferred by each transcription factor. Importantly, these differences are concentrated at medium and low affinity sites. Um, and we do see um, sometimes when we analyze a lot of chipsy data, uh, we see that high affinity sites of proteins from one family uh, tend to have chipsy peaks for several family members. And that is consistent with the fact that the family members are similar at high affinity sites. Uh, but then as we start to look at medium and low affinity sites, which are uh, different between paralogs, we don't see that many family members at each peak. Um, so really the the important differences are more at the medium um, and low affinity sites, but still way above non-specific binding. Um, these differences do contribute to differential in vivo binding as they allowed us to explain um, these differential chip seek peaks. Um, we do see um, that paralogs compete for DNA binding in the cell. And again, this competition will depend on the differential specificities of the paralogs. Um, Non-coding mutations can have different effects on transcription factor family members, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, and um, if you want to make predictions on your own sequences or get genome-wide predictions, um, we make uh, the data and the models available um, through our IMAT server. With that, I'd like to uh, thank mostly Ning, uh, who led this work. Um, and uh, Jin Kang, who developed the um, um, weighted least square regression. Um, Josh and Tristan generated some of the, and John generated some of the data. And um, Yuning contributed to the chip uh, analysis. Uh, we are lucky at our Center for Genomic and Computational Biology to have a team um, of uh, software engineers who can help us with things like web servers. Um, and of course, I would like to thank our uh, funding sources that allowed us to do this work, um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Raluca and Ning. It was a beautiful presentation. Uh, there is one question. Uh, in the meantime, if others have other questions, you can type them there, so I will read them after. So Sean, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, says, uh, nice talk, Raluca and Ning. Can, you approach, can your approach be used to compare TFs that have been characterized using universal PBMs? I'm thinking about TFs of interest that may have PBM data available from Uniprob or CISBP. Okay, I, I can take this one. Um, the short answer is no. Um, unfortunately, um, we can do that to very little extent because um, where we see these differences between paralogs, and I think um, Ning actually um, mentioned this, the differences are many times um, in the flanking regions, and even in the flanking regions beyond these um, proximal uh, positions next to the core binding site. So for these as positional as we are, um, models, we saw that we need about 20 base pairs to really recapitulate the binding specificity of the proteins. Um, and that's way more than um, we capture in a universal PBM experiment. Um, and just to, to give you an example, let me see, I think this, um, this plot here was showing uh, 
uh, that for MIC versus MAD comparison, um, the CAC GTG core is bound similarly, but the CAC GCG core is bound more by MIC and less by MAD. Um, if we look at universal PBM data and we look at eight MERS that have this alternative core, um, they look very similar between MIC and MAD. Um, the secret is really in the genomic flanking regions that give these proteins the difference in specificity. So unfortunately, there's very little we can do with the universal PBM data. Um, we are trying to look at CELEX as well uh, because they're the KMERS are longer. It's not eight MERS, it can be 12 MERS, 13 MERS and so on. Um, but there where what we found is that um, those experiments are typically capturing very well the high affinity range where the paralogs bind very similarly. Um, so because it's hard to get quantitative data with CELEX at the medium and low affinity range, um, there's so much noise in those measurements that we really cannot tell apart the proteins like we can with this data. Um, so we're still looking at <clears throat> alternatives. Um, for now, we're, we're using GCPBMs because they do capture these differences that we could not see with other assays very well. Uh, you're muted, Gonzalo. <laughs> <laughs> could you describe the position KMER SVR model details, KMER size, sequence length, if any flank included? Um, we actually have a hidden slide here. I didn't know if we'll have okay. time for it. Okay. Let me see if... Um, Okay, so um, basically these are 20 MER models um, that are centered on the core. So for example, for MIC and MAD, we have a six base pair core um, and we also have seven positions on each side. Um, and the SVR models we use that we saw work best are stratified by core. Uh, so th the way we define the core is to look at the um, uh, structures of protein, these proteins bound to DNA. And for BHLH proteins, for example, we see hydrogen bonding over this six base pair region. So we define that as the core. That's a region that has very little variation. Um, and for each core, we define, uh, we derive an SVR model um, that is trained like you normally train an SVR with um, cross validation and um, uh, embedded cross-validation to train the hyperparameters. Um, but it was important to train one model for every core um, because what we noticed is that the way the flanking regions influence binding can be different for different cores. Um, that practically means that there are interactions between the core and the flanking regions. Um, the way for us to capture this was to um, stratify the model by cores. You can think of it as a mixture model. Um, and once we did that, the accuracy was super high uh, for all the transcription factors we tested. And we included um, both one more, two more, three more sequence um, in the model. Yes. Um, and that was very important. Tumors are pretty much important for all the proteins. Um, some proteins really need three MERS to achieve good accuracy. I have one question myself, uh, if you have some minutes. So you have this nice comparison between affinities for uh, paralogs and you can find the impact of mutations in the affinities for different paralogs. Uh, do you think this kind of assays can be used somehow to uh, infer the mechanism on how EQTLs uh, influence expression for certain genes, especially that you work with cancer data? Ning, do you wanna give it a try? We think so, um, but we haven't taken this uh, uh, very far. What we yeah. hope is that at a minimum, um, it can help us um, by focusing our follow-up work on the paralog that is most affected. Um, how often that happens, we actually didn't get a chance to look at this in a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, really interesting. Ning might uh, be working on it. <laughs> okay, then we need to wait for the next paper. <laughs> Keep tuned.
Um, maybe we have some time for the last question. Um, so Sean, the one who, who made the first question said, so to follow up, follow up on the description uh, of the chip seek analysis, do you find similar conclusions at the GCPBM analysis if you train SBRs on the chip seek data or is it just too sparse and noisy? So uh, training SBRs on a chip seek data um, one thing is uh, that's a bit hard because we would have to align, identify in each ChIP-seq peak which binding sites are actually present. Uh, after all, the ChIP-seq data doesn't have that resolution. Um, even if we identify the binding sites and align them to get something similar to a, a GCPBM data, the problem is that the ChIP-seq signal doesn't correlate that well with the in vitro binding signal. Um, and of course, one could say that, oh, this is because in vitro data is in vitro and doesn't reflect that well in vivo binding. Um, yes, that's true. Um, there are going to be in vivo um, uh, differences. Um, but we've done some analysis in the lab after this paper to try to uh, better understand this comparison between the in vitro binding signal and the chip seek signal. And we do see that a lot of the chip seek signal actually reflects DNA accessibility. So if we treat it as a regression problem and try to learn specificity models with a chip seek signal as the variable we regress on, um, that would not give us the same model because those values um, reflect a lot of accessibility. Um, so they're not really quantitatively reflecting the binding, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I don't know well, if Sean is happy with that. But <laughs> I hope, yeah, that's maybe the, the, the bad part of virtual, that it's, ah, he smiled, so <laughs> it's okay. okay. So uh, thanks again, Raluca and 